Good morning. I must say that not in my wildest dreams that I ever imagined that I would be a speaker of a chapel service at Phillips. But I must say I appreciate uh, the privilege and opportunity to speak briefly. And I am brief. And I am too, I am aware that this is a March where we celebrate uh, Women's Month. month. And it was, a, it was a bit challenging finding a topic and Gina, she didn't put pressure on. She would just like, well, I kind of like to have this. If not today, I need a topic in the morning. No, no pressure there, right? And so I, I, I thought about it before I get into my, my, my text here, you know, as I was reading it, and I'll be, as you note on your, your bulletin, that I will be speaking from uh, the book of Mark, chapter 14, the third through the ninth verse, a very familiar uh, scripture text about a really bold woman. And so I, I thought about something, uh, I, uh, uh, Reverend uh, uh, Durham Williams, he tend to give these quotes, and always at the end of his quote, he'll say things like, do judge me. And I'm like, what, what do you mean, judge me? And he said, well, you know, many times when you make a statement or something that uh, go against uh, falsehood and you try to liberate somebody or educate them, he said, here comes the critics. So he said, I just go ahead and put it out there when I end it, do judge me. But Reverend Williams, I had a, a, a change, a switch here because I kept going over in my mind about this woman and I said I don't know she might have had a personality a little bit like mine. How dare you walk in a place sashay in uninvited. You know a good the fellas club having dinner how dare you and I was thinking but it kept going in my mind but she just did it and uh, Kurt I had a message that I had a package up front and I didn't order anything. And I went out and I said, are you sure that's mine? He said, your name's on it. And he said, as a matter of fact, it's a pair of shoes. Now I do love shoes, but I said, I didn't order any. I went to my desk and I said it there and I'm still going over in my mind about this topic. And I looked at that box and guess what it said? The seal, the tape going around it, it said, just do it. Therefore, there is my topic for today. <laughs> So I quickly was able to send a note to Jenna that I have one, and it's just do it. I will be reading from the New International Version of Translation. Mark, again, the 14th chapter, the 14th through the 3rd through the 9th verse. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head, and I'm talking about Jesus. Some of, these, so, some of those presents were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will have with you, and you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on uh, his on the body to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. The focus of my message today will be on the fourth, that fourth chapter. Some of those present were saying indignantly one to another, why this waste of perfume? 
It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. And they rebuked her harshly, the harsh criticism of this unnamed woman's extravagant gesture. We might plug in right here, right now, that there are just not people but systems, institutions, and forces that seek to oppress, suppress, stifle, restrain, and smother, thus attempting to cut off and rein in our highest aspirations, our inclination toward doing good in the world, or doing good for the kingdom of God. Some of us are even aware that uh, there are unbalanced relationships that result in unequal distributions of power in the world. Whether it is people, institutions, forces, or systems of power, each seeks to suppress others by forcefully putting an end to developing actions, expressions of feelings, impulse, or striving for the highest good. There's always somebody trying to stop you from do being the very best version of yourself. The indignant persons in the text remind me of an experience I encountered at a conference in Texas last September. This sermon, uh, this message is not meant to dwell on a particular person, but I'm using it as an example that can be applicable to anybody else. A clergyman sat down and began a rather pleasant conversation with me. Then he made a quick shift and began to complain about black clergy. Not once did he point out that he was that I was the person he was talking about. So I just kind of took for granted that maybe, you know, he wanted to throw that rock and hide his hand. I felt that uh much like the indignant persons in the text who do not speak directly to the woman, but they talked among themselves. Further, he shared that uh, often through the years while meeting with fellow colleagues, they discussed their disapproval for the lack of black preachers concerned from African mission. He said he found it shameful that black clergy did not spend more time commuting back and forth to, to Africa. He boasted that he and his friends at least made this journey at least once a year. He continued with this, I don't see why so much time is invested and wasted on people who have access to so much. I did not defend, but I offered to explain that black clergy stood in a void for people who have been pushed to the margins of society. Many clergy struggle with the plight of people of African descent. Excuse me. Daily. There is not the luxury of parachuting in and out of the country, nor distancing oneself from uh, African American people who are missed under represented in systems such as education, employment, judicial, and health care. I explained that there are approximately about 15 to 16 million children in the United States who go to bed hungry every night. We're looking at possibly one to six children, one out of six children who are hungry. And it is counted as a good thing to decrease that number when a clergy can provide food to a hungry family. And I text the woman broke the bottle of perfume to allow its oil to flow upon the head of Jesus. Clergy strive to break the seals of educational and other systems to enable knowledge to enter the minds and hearts of their youth. Dr. Owens, it is unfortunate the critics are not sensitive to the labor that is needed to break the thread of racism by opening schools, 
to thwart <laughs> inferior education to curb the appetite of legislators and investors who depend on headcount of the number of black males in the third grade. These numbers are, it is expected that the school system will fail them, and this creates a pipeline to the prison. And this number includes little girls as well. Clergy wrestle and plead with law enforcement due to this elusive, perpetual <laughs> suspect that has that uh, seems that sons and daughters always meet the description. And I say perpetual because this suspect has been around for a very long time. Many uh, clergy spend days and nights and lots of times praying with mothers and fathers and grandmothers, big mama, aunties and uncles who weep for their children. Many clergy persons are driven with compassion to do what is right for their communities. Their love is not limited and it does not disclude the people of Africa. They have cultural sensitivity to welcome them with open arms and embrace their culture, never forgetting the connection and root of their existence. Yes, doing what is right will bring out the critics. There is always some system, force, institution, a power that is looking to suppress our actions, aspirations, holy ambitions by seeking to entice us away from doing the will of God. We live in a time where there are repeated attempts to normalize oppression and convince us that this is how life ought to be. And this is just the way things are. And I'll just use the Negro colloquialism and when you say, you know, you bet not, or you better not, not bet better not, buck up against it. We are told this is just the way life is and there is nothing that can be done about it. Some of us cannot stoop low enough make others feel taller enough with, without so they can feel better about themselves. Some of us even pretend like we're dim-witted and not as alert or as intelligent. We pretend that we need special attention or special needs in order to journey through life. All this because someone else can't handle who we are and so we was, must disguise our identity and not be our authentic selves. We understand that nothing suppresses our highest aspirations. Nothing conspires against us to keep us from serving God and giving God our nothing can cause us to downsize our dreams and shut down our assignment like a critic. However, the nameless woman in the passage didn't allow the critics to stop her from doing what she came to do. She did not permit the opposers uh, to derail her from doing what she proposed to do for Jesus. Criticism should have stopped her. She wasn't an invited guest. Her name wasn't on the guest list. She showed up at Simon the leper's house where the men were having dinner. The women in this culture were marginalized, yet she is inserted into this, Mark has inserted her into this passage of text. Anyhow, who is this nameless woman? John called her Mary and Luke called her sinful. Mark doesn't tell us much about her. Nevertheless, she crashed the party with her alabaster container filled with nard and expensive perfume. It's costly because the posers even said that it was worth a yearly salary. That fragrance probably is comparable to fragrance today like Creed and, and Tom Ford and somewhere in that uh, Chanel perfume family. The woman did not attempt to defend herself from the upset men, but proceeded to do what she came to do. She may be nameless, but her actions speak louder than words. Jesus interjected on her behalf, and he told them, leave her alone. He declared that she chose to do a beautiful thing before his body for burial. And for this, Jesus said, wherever the good news is shared, her, her, her story will be told with mine. Mark interjected this story of this nameless woman between the plot to kill Jesus and Judas' portrayal. 
She can she became memorialized with Jesus. We don't need to know her name, but we remember what she did. Generosity and love for God and his glory and love for neighbor will bring out the credits. Words of behavior, the critic tends, tends to suppress our goodness. Nevertheless, while on our mission to do what God has equipped, ordained, and assigned, we should just do it. Our lip service to humanity must not be contingent upon the lip service of the scornful or the scorn from the opposer. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. <laughs>